Despite the well-known dangers of cave exploration, for some, it's all too tempting. They want to see nature's beauty with their own eyes, not just hear about it. Today, I have stories that are scarier than any other cave stories I've told before. What started as an exciting trip, with divers hoping to come back with great stories, sadly ended in a way that nobody expected. This is Fatal Tragedies with the story of three most tragic cave diving deaths in human history, part two. Starting our list is number one, the El Dudu Cave Diving Tragedy. El Dudu is a thrilling hidden gem on the northeast coast of the Dominican Republic. It's surrounded by tall cliffs where you can swim, snorkel, or dive into crystal clear waters. If you're into adventure, you can try a zipline free fall from 10 meters high. Located more than 110 miles from the capital city, Santo Domingo, El Dudu Lagoon is one of the best natural attractions in the country. Here, you can swim in freshwater, jump off rocks, and even ride a zip line over the lagoon. But El Dudu offers more than just fun outdoor activities. If you dip your head underwater, you'll discover that the lagoon goes as deep as 66 feet and hides a network of caves below. Now, El Dudu offers straightforward access with cement stairs leading down to the water's edge. It's a hot spot for both tourists and locals, drawing people from all around to enjoy activities like jumping into the water, swimming, and having a good time. The surface of the water provides an easy swim to the far left side, where a substantial tunnel begins, marking the start of the cavern line. This tunnel extends about 328 feet, featuring a spacious air dome 164 feet in. On the right side, there's a section with breakdown slabs and a warning sign. Here, you can connect to the cavern line at the yellow arrow, navigate through the restriction, and reach the main line of the cave, positioned right within the halocline. The initial section of the cave boasts a sizable and towering main tunnel adorned with numerous dark, tannic-stained decorations. One of the columns reaches an impressive height of over 49 feet, creating a stunning underwater landscape. The maximum depth in this area is 65 feet. As you progress through the tunnel, you'll encounter a steep slope at the end, ascending to about 9 feet. Here, a T-junction appears to the right as an air pocket with good air but no external access, while to the left, the cave continues its mysterious journey. Following the main line further, the cave's height decreases and you navigate through a series of peculiar dark stalactites before the tunnel widens once again. The subsequent part of the dive is characterized by a lack of decorations and generally shallower depths averaging only 6 to 7 meters. After approximately 45 minutes of swimming, you reach the end of the line, ascending to another entrance known as Cueva de Lili. This area often hosts bats, snakes, and typical cave critters like whip scorpions and tarantulas. Although it's possible to exit through Cueva de Lili, it can be a bit cumbersome. On the return journey, you have the option to swim around the sinkhole to the left and explore the cavern zone. This area comprises two additional tunnels leading to the third entrance called Pozo de los Caballos before turning back toward the stairs. The cavern zone offers a grandiose experience with impressive shellfish encrusted stalactites and unique watercolors making it well worth a visit. This is where the two Carloses thought it would be best for them to do their exploration. Little did they know that this cave would be their demise. Carlos Barbieri, aged 57, and Carlos Basso, 44, were all set for an adventurous cave diving escapade in the underwater cave system of El Dudu Lagoon. Now, these guys were known for going big in high-risk cave dives worldwide, but here's the twist. They didn't have the official cave diving certifications. So, an Italian diving instructor, Ed Sorensen, who ended up working on the rescue mission, warned Basso about entering the cave. He was concerned about Basso and told him to get some proper cave diving training. Basso, though, with a touch of overconfidence, waved it off saying, There's nothing new you can teach me. I know it all already. Wow. Ed Sorensen Speaking of Ed Sorensen, he's a distinguished technical cave diver renowned for his vast experience in rescuing and recovering divers lost or trapped in underwater caves. His operations often take place in challenging environments with zero visibility, requiring high adaptive thinking and situational awareness. 
One unique technique Ed employs is temporarily ceasing to breathe. This intentional action reduces noise, enhancing his ability to hear faint sounds, crucial for locating distressed divers. This technique proved notably effective in a rescue operation involving two students abandoned by their instructor. By silencing his breathing, Ed could better detect and locate the stranded individuals by listening to their screams in the cave. In a notable incident in 2012, Jeff Bauer, an IUCR diver, faced extreme challenges during a body recovery mission near a cave system in Tallahassee. Despite Bauer's expertise, he recognized the difficulty of the task in a particularly narrow section of the cave and recommended Ed Sorensen for the mission. Upon notification, Sorensen and his team swiftly prepared their equipment and reached the dive site in less than 10 minutes. The recovery operation was laborious and prolonged, involving seven divers over eight hours. Sorensen navigated through the narrow passages within the cave system, and the complexity escalated when he had to remove his diving gear to access a small opening. The body, in a state of rigor mortis, was wedged in a manner that temporarily trapped Sorensen during retrieval. With meticulous manipulation of the deceased's limbs, he successfully pushed the body back out through the constricted space. In his own words, what did I just do? Now there's zero chance of getting him out. Ed had to carefully maneuver to complete the challenging retrieval. When asked about how he deals with the psychological demands of such challenging tasks, Ed Sorensen adopts a practical approach. He acknowledges that, though it might seem emotionally detached, Focusing solely on the technical aspects of the job enables him to perform effectively under high stress and emotionally charged circumstances. In one instance, Ed received a video of a trapped individual. His initial assessment centered on the possibility of a rescue, considering the intricate nature of the cave's restrictions. Recognizing the urgency, Ed utilized a special harness he had designed in 2012 for a similar tight recovery mission. This harness featured a loop configuration around the neck and armpits, ensuring uniform force distribution across the entire torso. This design element was critical to prevent the risk of body parts getting ripped off during retrieval, especially when submerged in warm water for an extended period. Now that we have a strong understanding of Ed's background, let's switch back to our story. So despite the Carloses lacking all the necessary gear for such a tricky dive, these daredevils still plunged into the challenging caves of El Dudu Lagoon. An Italian diver who knew them remarked, The danger's not real to these divers. It's like they're playing a game of underwater roulette. He pointed out the main reason for their risky behavior. First, there's pure ignorance. Because they're so beyond their training, they don't even realize the dangers. Second, it's all about ego. The boastful belief that they can tackle something super dangerous and come out unscathed. You know, the classic, I dived in an underwater cave and here I am, kind of an attitude. But here's the kicker. When untrained divers venture into such hazardous spots, it's like playing a Russian roulette, and sooner or later, luck runs out. The divers stress that people with this mindset not only risk their own safety, but also become a big headache for others. Their recklessness can lead to complicated and dangerous missions for professional divers who have to step in for rescues and body recoveries. The Dive On the fresh morning of February 9, 2019, precisely at 11.45 a.m., the Carloses embarked on an underwater adventure in the El Dudu sinkhole. Their mission? To uncover a new and unexplored secret passage in the connecting cave system. As they entered the cave, a gateway to the daunting system awaited them. After navigating through some narrow passageways and right past a highly conspicuous warning sign, the cave system began to open up. A huge tunnel full of pillars, stalagmites, and stalactites winds even further and further into the bowels of the earth. Navigating through an extensive tunnel, they encountered a unique chamber with a rare natural feature, an air pocket. This underwater sanctuary provided a brief yet crucial moment for them to pop their heads above the water, breathe fresh air, and prepare for the journey ahead. However, as they pressed on, the once wide passages transformed into increasingly narrow and winding paths. Each turn and squeeze through tight passages posed a calculated risk, with thoughts of the walls potentially cutting or pulling out their air hoses connected to their dive tanks. Reaching a critical point near the terminal section of the cave, 
they faced a deceptive ascent towards an alternate exit called Cueva de Lily. This exit, a misleading path, diverged from their initial route and guided them towards a different and potentially more treacherous cave system. Their situation intensified dramatically. Their air supplies, the lifeline in this underwater cave, were rapidly dwindling, bringing them closer to a critical threshold. In a harrowing development, one diver became entangled in the guideline, the thread that would lead them back out of the cave. The severance of this line plunged them into disorientation, erasing their path to escape. To make matters worse, they had inadvertently followed a false dive line a remnant from previous explorers that could lead them further astray into another cave system. By late afternoon on the same day, the Carloses had not returned from their dive. A concerned friend alerted authorities, triggering an alarm for rescue teams to intervene. The search begins. The search team, led by Philip Lehman and Angel Compress, alongside local authorities from Cabrera, the town nearest to El Dudu Lagoon, organized a systematic approach to locate the missing divers. Facing the uncertainty of their location within the extensive cave system, Philip and Angel entered the water. Upon diving, they immediately encountered a significant amount of stirred-up silt, a fine particulate matter that severely reduces visibility underwater. This condition transformed the clear water into an opaque environment, hindering navigation and search efforts. The presence of excessive silt not only impeded their search, but also indicated recent activity and potential distress, suggesting that the missing divers might have passed through the area, possibly facing difficulties. Philip and Angel's challenge was navigating through compromised visibility while methodically searching the labyrinth of passages for the divers. Their strategy led them to a constricted passageway where they made a critical discovery, a severed guideline. Guidelines in cave diving are crucial for navigation and safety, and the broken guideline indicated a significant mishap. Relying on the silt to indicate the diver's path proved problematic, but it guided them to an essential clue. The poor visibility necessitated a temporary suspension of the search efforts, allowing the team to reassess the situation, plan a safer approach, and ensure the safety of the rescue team in the treacherous conditions of the El Dudu cave system. Despite rigorous efforts, the divers could not locate either of the missing individuals. The situation took a grim turn when they discovered the body of 57-year-old Carlos Barbieri and a narrow side passage of the cave, tightly wedged in a space that was difficult to access. The recovery of his body became impossible due to the challenging conditions. In the following week, the search made no significant progress in finding the other Carlos. The complexity and scale of the situation led to the decision to seek additional expertise. Calling in the experts In response to the challenging situation, Mike Young and internationally renowned rescue diver Ed Sorensen were summoned to the Dominican Republic. However, their heroic arrival faced an unexpected setback. Upon reaching the border, local authorities informed them that they were not permitted to enter the country. This news came while Carlos Barbieri's body remained lodged in a side passage and Carlos Basso remained missing. In a later report by the National Speleological Society, the reason for this refusal was somewhat strange. The government was not only aware of the diving accident, but also knew about the ongoing rescue mission that had been in progress for well over a week. They hesitated to allow two American rescue divers, Ed Sorensen and Mike Young, assuming that if it had taken this long, the operation must have been too dangerous. After hasty negotiations and possibly showcasing Ed Sorensen's track record, they were eventually granted permission to enter the Dominican Republic. However, there was a catch. They only had eight days to recover the bodies. After this period, the authorities would call off the search for good. Recalling the story later, Sorensen described how he brought special harnesses designed for extracting bodies. These harnesses were created to wrap around various points in the body because after being trapped and submerged for an extended period, the bodies might not come out intact. The urgency and complexity of the situation demanded swift and meticulous action from the experienced rescue divers. Rescue Efforts 
Navigating through the silt and intricate passages of the cave system, Ed Sorensen detailed how he explored the cave during the recovery mission. With one hand on his guideline and the other extended in front of him, he felt around for objects that weren't made of sand, water, or rock. In this way, he stumbled upon the still-trapped body of Carlos Barbieri physically bumping into him. Unable to extract the body alone, Sorensen called for the local crew to bring down milk crates filled with weights. These weights were crucial in pulling the body down just enough to maneuver it out from under the section of the passage where it was stuck. After approximately four hours of grueling work, the deceased Barbieri was successfully recovered. However, the whereabouts of the younger Carlos Basso's body remained unknown. The day after the exhausting recovery of Carlos Barbieri, Ed Sorensen and Mike Young returned to the cave. They continued their search in the same area, venturing deeper into the furthest depths of El Dudu. Sorensen reached a wall at the very back of the passageway before discovering the body of Carlos Basso, located in a crevice. To reach him, Sorensen had to let go of the guideline he held onto, with Mike Young taking control of the guideline while working with one hand to recover Basso's body. In contrast to the first recovery, Sorensen was able to extract Basso's body without additional help. However, due to the extreme depths at which the body was found, the entire recovery process took approximately four hours. Moving on, at first glance, it looks like a deep blue spot in the river. People usually flock into the area, ready to swim and to dive into the clear and seemingly safe water. But here's the twist. Beneath the surface lies a huge underwater cave. This spot isn't just risky in Texas. It's actually considered one of the most dangerous places on the entire planet. You heard that right. But why, you ask? Let's jump straight into it with number two, the story of Kent Maupin and Mark Brashear. The Enigmatic Jacob's Well Now, the story goes that in the mid-1850s, a settler arrived in Texas seeking a spot for a water-powered mill between San Antonio and Austin. While exploring along a creek, he noticed a rough area in the water resembling a bubbling cauldron. This turned out to be Jacob's Well, an outflow from a karst spring connected to the Trinity Aquifer. Jacob's Well initially had a powerful flow, creating an upside-down waterfall on the surface. A mill was built to harness this natural force, operating for decades until mid-20th century construction damaged the aquifer. The reduced outflow revealed a cavern beneath, turning Jacob's Well into a 12-foot diameter blue hole in the riverbed. The limestone rock, eroded with water, formed a large underground cave beyond what's visible in the river. Despite initial difficulty exploring due to strong currents, divers eventually delved into Jacob's Well, discovering its true size. While many enjoy swimming and cliff jumping into the river, Jacob's Well has gained notoriety as one of the deadliest diving sites globally, with tragic incidents marking its reputation over the years. The spring opening in the creek bed leads to Jacob's Well Cave, descending vertically about 30 feet before continuing at an angle. This cave system comprises silted chambers separated by narrow passages, reaching an average depth of 120 feet. Cave Diving Risks Divers from the Jacob's Well Exploration Project have explored and mapped the cave, revealing two main conduits. The first passage extends approximately 4,500 feet from the surface, reaching a maximum depth of 137 feet. The second passage branches off from the primary conduit, spanning around 1,000 feet. While the cave attracts open water divers, not all possess the necessary training and equipment required for cave diving. Tragically, between 1964 and 1984, Nine deaths occurred at Jacob's Well due to inexperienced divers attempting to explore its depths without the required cave diving skills. This underscores the importance of proper training and equipment for those venturing into this captivating but perilous underwater cave system. Now, on the night of September 9, 1979, two adventurous divers, Kent Maupin and Mark Brashear, along with a group of divers from Pasadena, set up camp at Jacob's Well in Wimberley. The mission? 
to explore the mysterious cave system. Eager to dive ahead of the large group and avoid disturbing the sediment, Kent and Mark entered the water at 23.30 while others set up camp. A dangerous descent and tragic consequences. Kent and Mark, both experienced divers in their early 20s, aimed not just to dive into the cave, but to reach the last recorded chamber known for its deadly history. As they descended through the first chamber, they navigated a 30-foot drop to a bare rock platform. Moving sideways into the second chamber, they encountered a long, sloping environment. Chamber 2 led to the birth canal at around 75 feet, a narrowing passage into Chamber 3. Here, they found other divers exploring what was considered the last safe chamber. Undeterred, Mark and Kent had their eyes set on a more challenging prize, Chamber 4, a location with a tragic history that had claimed the lives of four other divers. Descending the sloping gravel floor to the entrance of Chamber 4, at around 90 feet deep, they reach depths where divers can experience nitrogen narcosis. This neurological effect, akin to the impact of drinking martinis, becomes more pronounced with depth. Kent, affected by nitrogen narcosis, took over the scuba gear, turned around, and backed into the tunnel leading to Chamber 4. Mark followed suit. Jay Moy, another diver in Chamber 3, observed Mark's questionable move without cave gear or a proper light. Joe, aware the Kent and Mark's steel tanks held less air than his aluminum ones and being deeper, understood the increased air consumption. So he attempted to catch Mark's attention, flashing his light and concern and banging on his tank with a knife to grab their attention. But there was no response. Mark and Kent, seemingly with tunnel vision, continued into the tunnel. For Joe, he knew that this would well mean the end for them. In an attempt to guide them back, he left one of his torches at the entrance to Chamber 4, hoping the two divers would follow it to find their way out. Upon reaching the surface, the once clear water of the well turned murky, possibly due to a gravel slide or the frantic movements of two divers in panic. Joe couldn't shake the grim realization that it was highly likely that Kent and Mark had met a tragic end in the unforgiving depths of Jacob's well. He informed other divers of the unsettling events, setting the stage for a search and recovery mission. The hope for a rescue lingered in Joe's heart, but the harsh reality suggested otherwise. A call echoed through the local law enforcement channels, reaching Paul Batiglia, a police officer and seasoned cave diver. At the police station, he swiftly organized the rescue mission upon receiving the call. An hour later, he arrived at the home of Don Dibble, a former Navy diver, cave diving expert, and owner of the local dive shop. Both Batiglia and Dibble are members of the Hayes County Volunteer Body Recovery Unit, and they understood the grim reality. This is not just a rescue, it's a body recovery. In a somber discussion, Dibble and Batiglia planned the operation, knowing the challenges they will face. Despite the distinction between rescue and recovery, their course of action remained similar. They called upon other members of the recovery unit, headed to Dibble's dive shop for necessary equipment, and made their way to Jacob's well just 15 minutes away. As they arrived at the site, darkness still blankets the surroundings. The group from Pasadena, already in the water, reported to Dibble that they haven't been able to recover either Mark or Kent. They started their brief that the two divers might be inside Chamber 4. Their certainty seemed from one diver's claim of witnessing equipment buried under a gravel slide in the passage leading down into Chamber 4. But what had happened? Kent and Mark had excavated the tunnel by shoveling loose gravel, risking their lives for the sake of exploring a few more square feet of submerged limestone. And so they were buried deep beneath Chamber 4 now. The stage was set for a challenging and crucial operation in the depths of Jacob's well. How, you ask? The only safe retrieval method involved airlifting all the gravel out of the cave, starting from the top of the slope and working down. Talk about a heck of a lot of work, right? In an attempt to improve the challenging conditions, the recovery process took an unfortunate turn for the worse. Don Dibble, receiving conflicting reports about the feasibility of the mission, decided to descend into the well himself. Accompanied by Game Warden Calvin Turner, 
They left spare tanks at depths of 25 and 75 feet, while unreeling safety lines to guide them further into the well. To ensure the bodies were not floating above them, they directed their lights upward into the ceiling crevice of the third room. The entrance where the two divers had last been seen remained blocked. Don, aware of his remaining air supply, checked his submersible pressure gauge, showing 1,100 pounds per square inch, enough for approximately 10 minutes at that depth. With caution, he placed his head and shoulders into the entrance, gripping the safety line with one hand and illuminating the passage with the other. To his dismay, all he could see were small pieces of gravel striking his mask lens due to the water's flow through the constriction. The elusive sight of the missing divers remained hidden in the depths of Jacob's well. Gravel Bed In the realization that removing the bodies hinged on clearing the unstable gravel bed, Don Dibble understood the perilous situation. However, it was too late. He became ensnared in the passage entrance due to a gravel slide. The water turned murky, obscuring visibility, and Don found himself trapped with his arms immobilized, unable to signal or bang on his tank. As he struggled, his breathing quickened and he rapidly ran out of air. Confronting the inevitability of his impending demise, Don remained remarkably composed, attempting to meet his fate quietly. Uncertain about the drowning process and its implications, he considered hastening it by either inhaling or drinking water. Fearing panic and thrashing if he inhaled water, which would cause embarrassment for his wife, he chose to drink the suffocating water. As he took a few gulps, dizziness set in and he resigned himself to his fate. In a sudden turn of events, an involuntary reflex prompted him to thrash around, freeing himself through his flooded mask. Calvin Turner, recognizing the dire situation, offered Don the regulator from the spare tank. Breathing in the welcome dare, Don found relief. However, as he ascended to the surface, a new set of problems emerged. The excessive air intake while diving caused some of it to enter his stomach rather than his lungs. The decreasing water pressure as he rose made the trapped air expand, adding a new layer of complexity to the already harrowing experience. Attempting to release the trapped air by burping proved unsuccessful for Don. Realizing the risk of decompression sickness and the urgency to ascend, he endured unbearable pain caused by the expanding gas. Upon surfacing, he displayed a physically distended abdomen resembling a woman nine months pregnant. Removing his breathing regulator, Don let out a scream, but relief did not come until 12 hours later. Don's rare diving injury puzzled those around him, resembling some form of embolism where expanding air gets trapped in the lungs. The recommended treatment, a simulated dive in a recompression chamber, took place at Brook Army Medical Center. Unfortunately, the severe pain persisted, prompting a transfer to another hospital. Here, x-rays revealed a startling diagnosis. His stomach wall had ruptured, leading to peritonitis. Astonishingly, Don should have already succumbed to a condition equivalent to having five ruptured appendixes. When the surgeon opened his swollen abdomen, it was akin to cutting into a basketball, highlighting the severity of his internal injuries. During Don's recovery from surgery, the search for the missing bodies persisted. Don Broad, a seasoned diver from Austin, known for his gruff and opinionated nature, took on the task. Despite his tough exterior, he had harbored a deep fascination with Jacob's well since his childhood in El Campo. At 46 years old, he dove down deep to the opening of the last passage and peered inside. Spotting Dibble's dropped light, he observed a corridor filled with gravel, speculating that it contained the bodies. Realizing that Kent and Mark probably worked really hard to dig the tunnel by shoveling loose rocks that later had them perished, Broad decided the safest way to get the rocks out of the cave was to use the helicopter. They would airlift all the gravel out of the cave, starting from the top of the slope and working their way down. Two days later, a flatbed truck arrived at Jacob's well, carrying a white recompression chamber resembling a space capsule. This chamber, owned by Schaefer Diving Company, was brought in by the victims' families to retrieve the bodies. Louis Schaefer, the company owner, expressed optimism about the operation's success and became the first diver to descend. Visible from the surface until he reached the juncture at 25 feet, he exclaimed, God Almighty, 
upon seeing the entrance to the final passage, signaling the challenges that lay ahead. Later that afternoon, Lewis's divers used a large hose to suction gravel from the 60-foot level, spewing it into Cypress Creek downstream from the well. Larger rocks were placed into burlap bags, tied to ropes by volunteer scuba divers, and hauled to the surface. Despite their persistent efforts, the challenging task proved arduous, as every foot of gravel removed seemed to be replaced by another. Despite difficulties, they continued their work diligently. Financial constraints led to a temporary halt in the search operation. When divers resumed after two days, they discovered that the opening they had diligently cleared for a week had nearly closed up again in their absence. Faced with the daunting realization that their efforts could last for weeks or months and with no compensation for their work, the situation seemed increasingly futile. The second opinion from a group of divers sent by Chet Brooks from Brown and Root affirmed what Lewis's team had reluctantly admitted to themselves. The most prudent course of action was to leave the bodies undisturbed and seal off Jacob's well. Twelve days after Kent Maupin and Mark Brashear tragically perished, the search for their bodies was officially terminated. Several months later, after his recovery in January of 1980, Don, eager to prevent others from facing the same fate as Kent and Mark, took action at Jacob's well. Bags of concrete were lowered into the cave, and over several hours, he built a wall over the entrance of the fourth chamber. The wall incorporated a metal grate, allowing water to flow while sealing the bodies inside. Surprisingly, this deterrent proved ineffective. Some divers equipped with the necessary tools removed the grate, leaving a message for Don on a plastic slate that read, You can't keep us out. With the grate removed, divers continued to explore Jacob's well, pushing the limits of its deeper section. Four years after Kent and Mark's deaths, and three years after the gate installation, two members of an advanced diving class at Texas State University, Richard and Clark, aimed to complete a challenging dive. They navigated through the first two chambers in the third, reaching the squeeze where the gate had been installed. It's unclear whether divers had removed the gravel or if water flow had widened the crevice, but by the time Richard and Clark dived, it was accessible. Removing their air tanks, they shimmied backward through the narrow crevice. Clark's tanks got snagged on rocks, and despite efforts, he had to let them go to join Richard on the other side. Richard handed Clark his regulator, and they began buddy breathing, marking the end of their exploration for that day. What happened next is a story for another day. A decade after Mark and Kent's incident, most of Mark's remains were found, bringing some closure. Unfortunately, Kent's body was never recovered. Exactly 21 years later, Kent's remains were finally discovered, providing his family the closure that they had sought for so long, and he could be laid to rest. Finally, we have number three, the Polonora Cave Diving Tragedy, the Polonora Cave. Speaking of cave diving, one of these underground systems is the Polonora Cave, which has been graced by the presence of many cave divers and was greatly explored by a diver named Artur Kozlowski. The cave, situated in Kiltartan County, Galloway, Ireland, lies beneath a majestic beech tree on John Nolan's farmland. The cave holds a rich history, with the steps bearing imprints from a time when the community regularly fetched water from its well. The remarkable feature of Polonora Cave is its consistent water supply, even during dry seasons with minimal rainfall. The secret lies in the cave's limestone landscape, characterized by karst formations and underground streams that are more prone to flooding than drought. Approximately 196 feet north of Nolan's farmland is the entrance to Polonora Cave. Upon entering, one encounters a shaft that deposits thick layers of fine clay, covering the cave floor. Divers need to be cautious, as disturbing this area results in a complete loss of visibility and the settled particles take a considerable time to clear. The cave's roof is made up of boulder clay and loose rocks, creating a unique underground environment. While many shafts have been explored, indicating a significant length and depth, there are still numerous undiscovered mysteries waiting to be unveiled within the depths of Polonora Cave. Now, approaching the forbidden Polonora Caves was a big no-no. 
with locals always scared that the ground might just collapse if someone got too close. The cave had this mystical reputation because of the lurking danger inside. These caves were the leftovers of an ancient underground system filled with collapsed caves, water parts, and hidden caverns. Kozlowski caught wind of the Polonora Caves and got super interested in being the first to map them out entirely. But let me tell you what, it was risky business. Diving in those caves meant facing numerous dangers. Disorientation could hit if your dive line broke, or worse, if you didn't have one set up. Poisonous gas pockets lurked in the water-filled caves, and gas narcosis could mess with your head. Being deep underwater meant panicking was a real threat. A freaked out diver might grab your gear, rip off your dive mask, or kick up sediment, leaving you clueless about which way is up. And if your lights went kaput, well, you'd be trapped in the dark. Plus, you couldn't just swim to the surface if things went south. You had to navigate the same maze that took you deep into the cave. And don't forget, you're always running out of air. Despite all of these risks, the mysterious allure of the Polonora Caves had Artur Kozlowski hooked. Speaking of, here's a little of Artur Kozlowski's life. Artur Konrad Kozlowski, born on October 17, 1977, was a highly talented and dedicated cave explorer. Throughout his life, he achieved significant success by exploring new caves and connecting different cave systems, pushing the boundaries of cave diving depth in Great Britain and Ireland. In 2006, he made a remarkable dive, reaching a depth of 338 feet. Originally from Poznan, Poland, Artur relocated to Ireland, where he spent his final years before his passing in 2011. In Poland, he worked as a quantity surveyor and he continued his professional pursuits in his new environment. Notably, he contributed to projects such as the Aviva Stadium and Houston Square Developments in Dublin. Additionally, he played a role in compiling maps for Galway County Council and the National Roads Authority, particularly for the design and development of the M18 motorway. While he was already a qualified diver with 13 warm water dives under his belt before arriving in Ireland, his interest in underwater exploration reached new heights in the country. Despite his proficiency as an open water diver, he recognized the distinctive challenges of cave diving, understanding that it required a different set of skills than the graceful floating experienced in open waters. And caves have many awful tight turns, many of which are dark and challenging. The uncertainty of what lies beyond the next turn adds an element of mystery requiring individuals to navigate and decipher the cave's secrets on their own. Venturing into uncharted territories within a cave is a journey toward potential discoveries, but it also entails engaging in perilous maneuvers. This is why cave diving demands a diver's exceptional training and skills. And so, what did he do? In 2007, recognizing the need for specialized training, he underwent cave dive training with Martin Farr, a renowned Welsh cave diver instructor widely regarded as one of the best in Ireland. To hone his skills, Arthur chose Hell Complex, a part of the Greenholz group of underwater sea caves located off Dolan, County Clare, as his training ground. This experience equipped him with the expertise required to navigate the intricate and challenging underwater cave systems. Artur's Discoveries and Achievements Upon commencing his cave diving endeavors shortly after completing his training, he delved into exploring and mapping previously undiscovered passages. His initial breakthrough came with the first traverse between Hell's Kitchen and Robertson's Cave near Reef Complex. He played a pivotal role in extending cave systems in both Ireland and Spain leaving a lasting mark on the exploration landscape. One of his most noteworthy achievements was the extension of the Marble Arch Cave System in County Fermanagh. Artur's diving connections to Prad's Pot Cascades doubled the cave system's length from 2.7 miles to an impressive 6 miles. These connections were later linked to the newly established Monastery Sink Upper Cradle System, 
expanding its reach to 7.1 miles, making it the longest cave in Northern Ireland. He not only set records for the longest cave, but also established another milestone for the deepest cave in Great Britain and Ireland, located in Plotomary near Killa Valley, County Mayo, Ireland. This cave system reaches a depth of 338 feet. His achievements in cave exploration included navigating the challenging underwater passages of the Fort region, covering a distance of 6.2 miles. Additionally, he discovered and explored Palandro, the third deepest sump in Great Britain and Ireland, measuring 0.6 miles in length and reaching a depth of 269 feet. In recognition of his outstanding contributions to cave exploration, he received an award at the annual Polish Travel and Outdoor Sports event held in Gdynia in March of 2011. During a dive that tugged at his heart, on Sunday, September 4, 2011, he found himself inside a cave surrounded by loud rumbling. Anxious, he checked his gear, fearing a cave collapse or earthquakes, terrified at the thought of being trapped. He listened closely and discovered it was just traffic noise from the road above. Artur, making strides in mapping the Planora cave system, had only three caves left. His mission was to connect Poldalin and Poltafil, tackling the most dangerous Planar 10. The success of this mission would prove a connection between the two caves. He believed forging the connection from Poltafil in 2009 would be easier. Leaving his dive line about a mile from the entrance, he entered Potterville. Additional ropes were set up at the surface for a possible retreat. Facing a powerful flow, he descended carefully to 69 feet, pausing at this unprecedented depth. Despite the heavy flow behind him, Artur and Control knew the risks ahead. At that depth, a descending channel emerged. He reached 196 feet, but panic set in as his diving line broke. Descending further, he expected to see the large reel tied the year before. Instead, the line was loose, tied behind a small boulder. In this extremely scary situation, he attached a fresh reel, navigating a narrow and sharp passage. The passage rose, then descended across a level clean floor, revealing the unpredictable challenges of cave exploration. However, Arthur realized he was still moving in the right direction, having faith he was on the correct track. After two and a half years and 45 dives on both sides, he was shocked to discover the connection with Poldalin. Yet, the moment held a surprising emotion for him. Instead of elation, he felt sadness, perhaps because it was all over. After numerous challenging and exhausting dives with close calls, the link between Palafil and Poldalin was finally found a significant achievement for Artur. However, he still had one more task, mapping out Planora 10 fully, the Demise Descent. With careful preparation, time, and multiple dives, Artur attempted this daunting task over a weekend. On Monday, September 5th in 2011, he went diving as usual, depositing stage oxygen bottles for decompression and emergencies. Knowing the risks, he made arrangements with friends to raise the alarm if he didn't return by 9 p.m. At 2 p.m., Artur went into the cave, telling his friends he'd be out by 5 p.m. Since it was a super rainy day, his pals chilled out while Artur explored underwater. But when 5 p.m. rolled around and he didn't show up, his friends got worried. Since they weren't expert divers, they reached out to their more experienced buddies and soon, the whole crew was on high alert. Entering Planora 10, Arthur had about six hours before needing to come out due to air limitations. He pushed himself through confined sections, swiftly moving toward his dream of fully mapping the cave. However, when he wasn't back by 5 p.m., concern grew among his friends, leading to the involvement of professional rescue divers. As news spread, media activity heightened in the local town. Specialist search and rescue teams from Ireland, Wales, and England joined the rescue attempt. Unfortunately, the hope of finding Artur alive diminished quickly due to the challenging cave conditions. Conflicting reports emerged, suggesting Artur had gone too far or that even if his body was found, 
bringing it to the surface might be impossible. Despite the uncertainty, they held on to the hope that Artur, experienced in handling close calls, would find a way to survive until supplemental oxygen could be delivered. Recovering Artur's Body The initial search was coordinated by Artur's friend, Jim Marnie, who was devastated by the situation. The local town became a hive of media activity as everyone anxiously awaited news about Artur's fate. Jim, renowned as one of the area's most skilled divers, was seen as the person with the best chance of rescuing Artur. The devoted father risked his life, dropping everything to bring Artur back to his family. As a member of the Irish Cave Rescue Organization, Jim spent Monday night tirelessly searching for possible air pockets within the cave, where he thought Artur might be hiding. Despite the extreme danger, Jim conducted dive after dive, inspecting various areas of the cave. On Monday night, when hope seemed to dwindle, Jim discovered a dive line that Artur had set up, running the entire length of the cave. British cave divers Rick Stanton and John Bellathan, considered among the best in Europe, were called in to assist in the rescue mission due to their extensive experience and training in technical diving environments. Arriving in Ireland on Wednesday evening, over 48 hours since the initial alarm, they joined Jim inside the cave diving down 1,200 feet without success. Simultaneously, Jim explored an unsearched part of the 800-meter wide cave, about 52 meters deep. Connor McGrath of the Irish Cave Rescue Organization revealed the discovery of a large airspace halfway into the cave, providing hope that Artur might be inside. Another airspace near the surface added to their optimism. Locals, though aware of the cave's dangers, respected Artur's courage in taking on the challenging mission of mapping it. The skilled diver's decision to explore the cave was seen as an honor by the community. Tragically, Jim Warner found Arthur's body in an underwater passage around 6 p.m. on Wednesday. It took Jim an hour to dive into the narrow passage where Artur's body lay, fully equipped with oxygen tanks and a guide rope just over a mile from the cave's entrance. Artur's situation was heart-wrenching as he couldn't find an air pocket with enough oxygen to survive. While being able to bring his body back to the surface and Jim's discovery provided some consolation, Artur was given the highest respect when his lifeless body was brought above ground. A doctor confirmed his demise and he was taken to University College Hospital Galway for a post-mortem examination. However, the autopsy report contradicted the assumption of a lack of air, as he had sufficient supply for more than six hours, planning only a three-hour dive. When his body was recovered, all of his equipment remained intact and attached. So the question remains, what could have taken the life of an experienced diver? No one can tell. News of Artur's story spread throughout the nation, and when his passing was confirmed, the entire country mourned together. The realization that they would never see him again left everyone deeply saddened. His friends, devastated by his loss, paid tribute by creating a film about his life called Riders of the Storm, featuring footage from his own camera. The film was screened by the sub-aqua societies of Trinity College Dublin and University College Galway, earning a prestige award at a Polish film festival. Despite the inherent risks of cave diving, Artur remained passionately devoted to the sport until the very end. His unwavering commitment reflects a trait shared by many successful individuals, an undeterred pursuit of their passions, even in the face of death. Artur went beyond the limits set by his mentor, Martin Farr, the Welsh cave diving instructor. His legacy lives on in the cave diving community through his discoveries of new caves. While recognizing Artur's impact on his community and the world, the Irish Speleotology planned a memorial for him in August 2012 to be held in Polonora Cave. Artur's contributions made him a true hero in the eyes of the Kiltartan community, his friends, and his family. And in 2013, a fundraising page was created to collect funds for a headstone for Kozlowski's grave in Kiltartan and a plaque at the entrance to Polonora 10.
The engraving of the plaque and headstone was done by a stonemason based in Gort on September 6, 2014, marking the third anniversary of Kozlowski's passing. Friends and family gathered for the unveiling of the gravestone and plaque. Well, which of these gripping cave exploration tragedies do you find more intense? Drop your thoughts in the comments below, and remember to hit that like button, subscribe, and ring the notification bell for more captivating stories. Your opinion matters. Until next time, stay engaged, stay curious, and stay safe.